And now, <laughs> the worldwide phenomenon. One records in Stowe Market, the other records in Houston. Alex Moss, Burton DeWitt, join forces to bring you <laughs> the weekly Dartcast 180. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the weekly Dartcast. I'm Alex Moss and joining me as always, my co-host, Dart Statistician, Burton DeWitt. How are you doing? I'm doing well, just enjoying a nice evening of darts or afternoon for me. How are you, Alex? Good to hear. Yeah, I'm doing well too. And we're back in the midst of the world match play. The second round has just come to a close a few minutes ago when we were recording this. So we thought we'd bring you an episode during the tournament. And tonight, last night, when you listen to this, we've seen Michael Smith, Nathan Aspinall, Michael Van Gogh and Peter Wright all make it through to the quarterfinals tonight. Never mind it being a wide open for the title. How do you pick a winner from that bottom half of the draw now? Uh, well, you've you flip a four-sided coin from what we saw today. You know, I'll start with the former world number one, Michael Van Gerwen. I mean, he came out of the gates flying in that match. Uh, the second session was really pedestrian, but if you take that out of the match, he really did play well. He missed some doubles at the very end when he had a chance to close it out, and it's something what we saw last year in a couple of the televised events and Simon Whitlock in the Grand Slam a couple other times as well, where he had trouble closing the door. But if you take that out, if you take the second session out, it was a really good performance from him. And the second on the spin. And that's got to give him some confidence and got to make him the favorite in this bottom half. But again, the inconsistency that's been the mantra now for a while is the big thing cutting against that. Both of his matches, he had one really poor session. Difference was Ian White was equally poor during the poor session for Van Gerwen today. Damon Hedda was not, and that's why Van Gerwen was in trouble in that match uh, heading into the final break. Well, I guess he wasn't in trouble as well against Ian White, but not in. he wasn't 6-4 down and looking the second-best player. He was 5-all and looking better, but not playing well enough. But that aside, he looked pretty darn good. Peter Wright, other than missing a few darts at the end of the uh, first session to keep uh, Joe Cullen in the match, it easily could have been 5-0. Peter Wright was brilliant. That was one of the best, if not the best, performance we've seen from someone in this tournament. And he's talking a big game. He's talking as if he's the favorite. He's not. He hasn't been. He's closer to now, especially after those two wins and getting through to the quarterfinal. But he looks fantastic. Nathan Aspinall, <laughs> what a match that was with Gary Anderson. Ignore the stats. The stats make it seem worse than it was because they each had some patchy moments. But for the most part, they were playing brilliantly and they were hitting each other. They were hitting each other back. You know, Gary Anderson's one for nine. It wasn't to save the match fine because he still had some room to spare. But it pretty much was because if he doesn't take that out, he's 10 seven down. And what does Nathan Aspinall do? Very next leg. It's a 117. Again, with Gary waiting on a double for a 12 darter to break and to basically put it away. Although breaks just kept coming. Nathan Aspinall played a lot better than that 99 average said. Same for Gary Anderson with his 97 and looks every bit the player that lifted a major trophy, not two, two and a half years ago now. And Michael Smith, another one of those were as the match went on, the players missed doubles, but it doesn't take away from how well they played and how they played at each other's level. They brought each other up and they tore each other back down when they were struggling, when they were getting close to the finish line. Michael Smith, though, lifted his game, got over the line against the best player in the world in Jose de Sousa. How do you pick a winner from the bottom half? You don't, because from what we saw, all four of those players look like the type of player that can go on and win the title. But at the same time, Peter Wright aside, well, even Peter Wright at the end of that first session, they all showed some fragility that makes you have to question, will they get it done? They both, they all four of them gave their opponents opportunities. But at the end of the day, they won. They're in the, the quarterfinals and they have every chance to get out of that bottom half. It's impossible to pick. Yeah, I think you're absolutely spot on. It is a very hard half of the draw to call now. All four of the players will be going into Friday night thinking that we can make the semi-finals, we can go one step further, make the final. I'll start with one player who is the only player from that quartet of players that is yet to win a major title, and that is Michael Smith. We've said for so long he's going to be the next player to win a first major title. We've seen other players beat him to it, but tonight it just felt like a, a big win for him, beating Jose de Souza, a player that has won a, a major title in the last 12 months. He's a, a Premier League runner-up as well. He's a player that is one of the best in the world at the moment, but 
I've got to mention that 108 finish. Uh, Jose missing the match start for 12-10, pulls out a 108 finish, and that is going to do Michael Smith's confidence that the world are good, knowing that he's able to do that when the pressure is amongst it. And it is basically do or die. You miss this shot and you are going out of the tournament. So he'll be feeling very good about himself going into the quarterfinals. I love this. his gladiator mention as well on the uh, the post-match interview. That was a bit of a surprise, but he's going to be going into the quarterfinals. And I know his record against Peter Wright, especially in TV knockout games, is very poor, but it's another chance for him to go further. And the, the match play is a tournament that the last couple of years he has done very well in. And Peter Wright got to the final before. He's been a little bit up and down this year that the gold darts, they've been out this week, changed the, the flights and the stems after the first five legs and he blew Joe Cullen away for the, the rest of the game, winning it at 11,505 average, as you say. That's the, the best we've seen so far. And he is a player that is, again, talking himself up. He, he's done it many times before, but he's got a lot more attention this week, I think. But he said he's going to win the match, play the World Championship. He's getting closer to that. He needs uh, another three wins to do it, but he, he's on the right way. And that other quarter-final, Michael Van Gogh and Nathan Aspinall is going to be a, another great game. Two players that we've said before, two of the, the players that have really missed the crowd, but OK, Nathan Aspinall, you, you've seen in his performances, he's pulled out some some big shots at times. Michael Van Gogh in the same, the 1-2-1 the to win it tonight. They've both got that ability to pull out a, a big shot, a big leg under pressure and first to 16, best of 31 legs. This will be the longest these two have played against each other yet. It's set up for a, a really exciting game. And yeah, like you, it's just so hard to call a winner from those four at the minute. Well, let's talk, though, the top half of the draw now. On Tuesday, we saw Gurren Price and Dimitri Vandenberg both average north of a ton to set up a mouth-watering showdown in the quarterfinals, while uh, Christoph Otaiski and Callan Ritz on his debut made it through uh, to face each other in the other quarterfinal. Has the top half played out, though, like you thought it would? I think for the most part, yes. When the seeds were set, this was before the draw was made for the first round, and we saw that there was that potential that we were licking our lips, I guess. We could have a, a going price Johnny Clayton game in the second round, the Premier League champion against the world champion. And that is what we got after the first round, those two both going through. And it wasn't a great game in the end. It wasn't a close game that we thought it was going to be. Going price winning it 11-3, that was a bit of a surprise. But to see going price in the quarterfinals, not a huge shock. Dimitri Vandenberg as well. There was a, a few question marks. How's he going to get on with the Winter Garden stage? But... Pretty much like everything that's been thrown his way over the last 12 months, he has really taken to whatever it is, whether it be the Premier League or getting to a, to a major final like he did last year, 12 months ago, and, and winning this world match play. He just seems to take everything in his stride. And it, it was such a great game he had with Dave Chisnell, the, the 14 180s in that game. And I think two or three times he kicked off a leg back to back 180s. So again, he is a player that is playing with a huge amount of confidence. And we, we're seeing a lot of the ability that he has. I think there's still more to come from him, but we're seeing a lot of his ability on show. So to see those two in that in that quarterfinal, I'm not overly surprised by that. I think we go to the other quarterfinal, though, that is where you're probably raising an eyebrow or two. And I'll start with Christoph Ratajski because he just seems to always go under the radar, but he's a player that has now made three consecutive quarterfinals in TV ranking events, the World Championship at the start of the year, the UK Open, and now the World Match Play as well. But... His floor form's kind of dipped off this year and we go back, it wasn't so long ago, we were saying is a good player on the floor, can he take it onto the TV? But nowadays it's, it seems like he's peaking for the TV events, which that's where the big money is, that's where you're going to get your big titles. So he'll be happy with that. Callum Reed's that is the, the surprise, isn't it, to see him get to his first big quarterfinal, first quarterfinal on TV. We A lot of people were backing him to win that game against Glenn Durant and it wasn't the the best game ever, but he got over the line. And even in the second round, he was 5-2 down to Rob Cross. Should have really been 7-2 down. Rob Cross missed a lot of doubles to really go clear in that game. But every credit to Callum Reeds, 11 out of 14 on the doubles. The four balls I finishes, I was putting on Twitter, we need to call him the, the ball from now on. But fair play to him for, for coming back in that. And he does seem like he's starting to relax on the stage. The average is, is climbing up a little bit now. Can he produce it over a best of... 31 next game, that's going to be a big test for him. But see him getting the quarterfinals, that must have been the big surprise, I think, from that section of the draw. Which is interesting because you just said on our last show that he was the uh, unseated player that you thought would go the furthest. So <laughs> you're calling it a surprise, but in a way you also tipped it. And it, it isn't as much of a surprise as it might look at because of how Glenn Duran has struggled. Because, well, we know 
he can win he can win titles. He's won one already this year. Rob Cross hasn't. It was really impressive how he lifted his game as that match went on. Cross was ahead, and then Rich just blitzed him after the second uh, interval and just ran away with that in the end. It was yes, it was eleven eight that appears close, but remember Rob Cross was ahead for much of that match, and then Rich won. I I think it was seven of the last nine legs to really just pull away and. Yeah, okay. We have we haven't seen Callan Ritz hit his top gear. He only averaged eighty two and ninety two, but he does seem like he's getting better and getting more comfortable. That match against Glenn Durant, they both were averaging below seventy at the very beginning. They both were averaging in the mid seventies uh, halfway through that match, and they both lifted and got more comfortable. Glenn Durant, we did even see Durant play probably in the second half of that match. Match, the best we've seen him play in quite some time, um, not nearly like what we would have seen a year ago, but we did start to see just some moments that he was feeling comfortable. Callan Ritz similarly got into that match as it went on. As far as Christopher Tyski goes, I, I'm going to have to disagree with you. I, I don't – and you're you're not the only person who has said this. Everyone's been saying that Ritaisky's dipped this year. Has he? Last year in the Players' Championship events – he averaged 96.89 across 79 matches. Good for seventh on the tour. This year, okay, fine. He has dipped. He's gone from 96.89 to 96.85. He's gone down <laughs> four one hundredths of a point through 48 matches. And he has dropped from seventh in the averages to eighth. What a dip that is. You look at the last set of players' championship events. Okay, he went out first round two matches. Twice. Once was in a last leg decider against Kim Hybrex, who was on form. And the other, he had a bad match against uh, Willie Borland. Still averaged 93 and a half, which was the second lowest average he had across nine matches in Bolton that week. So, okay, he's dipped. He's still playing at a very high standard. He's still playing at the eighth highest standard in terms of average of any player in the Players' Championship events. I don't see where this dip has been. The thing that's dipped is he hasn't gotten the same results. He hasn't won a title this year. He's only made one final. That is not the Christoph Pateisky bolt, but he's playing well enough. He just hasn't put a day together where he was able to get over the line. He's still one of the best players in the world. He's still better than his ranking. He's ranked 13th. He's better than that, and he showed that across the two matches. There is nothing surprising about him getting to the quarterfinals. The only surprise is that he had to beat Luke Humphreys because Luke Humphreys destroyed, dismantled James Wade in the first round. And we can't really say anything about Goran Price or Dimitri Vandenberg. That is the quarterfinal we would have expected. Nothing against Johnny Clayton or Dave Chisnell. We wouldn't have been that surprised if they got there. But the two best players in the top quarter got through to the quarterfinals. I'm not really all that surprised about what the quarterfinals are. And I don't think anyone should. Callan Ritz is the outsider, but he's not all that much of a surprise, especially with the draw he got. And now we'll move on to our first guest on this week's show, and it is with the TalkSport commentator, Ian Danter. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by the TalkSport commentator, Ian Danter. Thanks for the time, Ian. How are you doing? Yeah, good, thanks, Alex. How are you doing? Doing good, thank you. And firstly, you're in Blackpool for the World Match Play this week, working as part of the TalkSport team's coverage. We're four days into the tournament now. How have you found it so far? Well, it's been really intriguing. We we came into it looking at the, the 32 players, and in that first round, myself and Paul Nicholson and Chris Mason and various others, not just the, the, the talk sports team, were looking and thinking, well, how many seeds are going to drop out? Is it going to be five, six, seven? You know, is it going to be a real struggle? But as it turned out, you know, the seeds have done remarkably well up to this point. There's only been, you know, a two or three seeds that have fallen by the wayside in that in that first round. One of those was kind of expected with given Glenn Durant's form that Callan Ritz was always going to pressurise him uh, and given Ian White's previous form against Daryl Gurney. Uh, in their head-to-heads. So, you know, the, the 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 surprise is that there haven't been that many surprises. Yeah, well, we'll come back to this week's starts later, but whenever we have a guest on from the media, as a, a budding journalist myself, I'm always keen to hear the story of how it started. So how did your work in the world of sports journalism begin? Uh, it was a complete fluke. It was not by design, uh, necessarily. Um, during the, uh, the 1990s, I was a, a guitar salesman in Birmingham, working in a music shop, um, and through a, through a succession of strange quirks of fate and circumstance, um, I 
got a job on BRMB radio as the flying eye travel reporter towards the end of the 90s, doing the old eye in the sky stuff every morning uh, above uh, the city of Birmingham. And um, so once I was working within BRMB radio, an opportunity came up to work for Tom Ross as um, a football reporter. And I took that uh, and was going around the country following the likes of, you know, Warsaw and Birmingham City and West Bromwich Albion. And then I joined TalkSport in 2004 uh, as a football reporter. And as TalkSport have increased their portfolio of sporting rights, I've not only been doing football commentary for them uh, for the last 10 years or so, but also uh, a bit of cricket here and there. And uh, and then the darts came along uh, when we started doing the World Championships uh, three or four years ago. And what a complete privilege that was to, to, to start doing that. Cause it's a uh, a sport I've always loved. You mentioned talk sport. You've been with them now for the, the best part of 20 years. During your time, you've, you've covered football, World Cups, European Championships, some of the biggest games. What's it like calling the action during those big moments? Uh, you, 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 never, um, you never lose that sense of the, the responsibility that's on your shoulders broadcasting to a, you know, an audience back home that would love to do what you do. Uh, and you, know, you, have, you have to get things right. You have to prepare meticulously and uh, and try and treat it like any other game of, of football that you're watching, you know, so that you don't get um, kind of sucked in by the occasion and let that affect the way that you perform and let that affect the way that you commentate. Um, you still got to tell people, you know, what the score is, where the ball is, what's going on, how long's gone, which way they're kicking, that sort of things. But sometimes the occasion of a game and, and the quality of the game matches the occasion. And I can think of places like Russia in the World Cup three years ago where I saw some of the greatest football matches I've ever had a privilege to commentate on like Spain 3, Portugal 3 or Belgium 3, Japan 2 uh, which were just astonishing games of football to, to cover and you, you walk away from those games and you, you're walking back to your hotel that night thinking what what the hell have I just witnessed you know um, and, and that was me calling it that I got that I got that job to call it that's um, that's incredible so it's never lost on me the, um, the, the you know the, the privilege that I have for the job that I do, and I always try and make sure that you know, every commentary that I do is, is is you know no less prepared for than any I've done previously or any I'll do in the future. Well, let's talk about darts on the radio then. When your boss at TalkSport said that they had secured radio coverage for the PDC World Championship a few years ago and they wanted you to be involved, what was your initial reaction to that? Well, I do remember in the very, very early days of, of TalkSport, before I was there, so you're talking um, the early 2000s, they did do darts um, because in those days uh, they were desperate to get um, any sporting rights because the BBC held the whip hand and they tried darts. I'm trying to remember what tournaments they did. I'm not sure it was the Worlds, but... Um, they kind of left it by the wayside. It was a challenge, you know, because as soon as you say to somebody, oh, you're going to do darts on the radio, they have this idea in their mind that you're just going to say, he throws the dart, he <laughs> hits the board, he throws the, the next dart. It's, you know, do you know what I mean? It's yeah. that, 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 that thing that they, they have a preconceived notion of how a, a commentary on darts is going to go, but it's not about that. Darts is an incredibly deep and complex psychological sport and there are so many aspects to a game of darts that you can bring across you in a commentary. Not, you know, whilst the darts are hitting the board, but you're thinking of where's that dart player going to go next? What's his what's his MO? You know, what, what are his little idiosyncrasies? You know, when does he go down to the 19th? At what point in the legs do he start to think about, you know, what his opponent's doing? What are the crowd doing? How are they influencing him? There's so many elements to it. Um, so you try and bring that to, to the commentaries you do um, on, on talk sport with with the darts. It's, it's 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 really all about getting that excitement across, whether there's a crowd in or whether there isn't. About a, a player can be one visit away from a complete uh, you know you know meltdown, or one visit away from total ecstasy the reaction to darts on the radio it's, it's gone down very well talk sport now regularly covers the, the world championship you've covered other events in the past too you're back at the winter gardens this week as we mentioned for those of our listeners who haven't perhaps tuned in yet what can they expect here when they listen to talk sports coverage well one of the great things that that um 
Mike Bovill, who was the head of sport at the time when darts on the radio was being brought back, one of the great things he did was he uh, listed Paul Nicholson and Chris Mason as darts of summarizers. And so when you've got Nico and Mace with you uh, at, at a tournament, then you're in safe hands. From, from my perspective, you're in safe hands because you know that they watch so much darts and they keep a complete tab on what everybody's doing. But they, they also put things across with a sense of humour and, 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 and they have the same excitement about the game as I do. Um, I think that's crucial. Uh, I can, you know, be as descriptive as I want to be as a as a commentator uh, about what's going on, but the knowledge that those two can impart, but also the humour and, and their experience. You know, Nico can talk about the fact that he hated standing on that stage in Blackpool. It did something to him that he didn't like, and he never never progressed the way he wanted to with it when he was playing at the World Match Play. These are the sorts of things that, that again, we're going back to the psychology of, of darts that are absolutely fascinating. But, you, you know, you try not to get bogged down in any particular area. You're just trying to entertain the listeners with every aspect of this fantastic game. Um, but I think that's, that's what you should expect when you tune in. There's a sense of humour about it, but there's a love uh, and there's a desire to be as descriptive and as uh, you know factual as possible but also just to get across the sheer particularly now the crowds are back in the sheer delight of uh, of you know high quality darts being played in front of a of a couple of thousand people who are just delighted to be there to witness it in person definitely yeah and I, I remember a tweet you put out last year of all the notes that you make in preparation for commentating on the football what's it like for the yeah. darts as far as resources online darts probably not as popular as football but how much prep goes into covering a session well yeah there's a, there's, there's a fair degree of prep that goes into it you, you've, you've got to know you know it's, it's fairly obvious you know that Gerwin Price is world number one and he's won the world championship that's fine but um, you know keeping in touch with the, the darting world you know, for the floor tournaments and, you know, everything that goes on in whether it be Coventry or Milton Keynes or Barnsley, Bolton, Wigan, wherever the, you know, the, uh, the the floor tournaments take place, you know, you garner information from that. And the internet is, is pretty good, obviously. There are quite a few subscription services that help you along with some of the finer points of, you know, statistical analysis of a player. Um, I'm particularly intrigued in head-to-head -head records you look at something like Gerwin Price against Johnny Clayton in last night's game where Price has now won eight in a row against the Ferret. Um, and you see this in all sorts of sport, not just darts, that thing where a, a player or a team just seems to have a, a block when it comes to taking on another opponent where they just can't, they can't get past that opponent. That there's something that just won't let them go that extra mile. Uh, I think that's a really fascinating aspect of, of, of prep. I, I certainly don't do quite as much as I would for a football match. Um, you, you, as you say, you'll see my pinned tweet at the top of my uh, Twitter feed, that talk dance where I've got two football games coming up and I've got all players prepped and all sorts of stats. With darts, I do have some stats prepared, probably a page rather than three or four. But, you know, it's, it's more than enough to at least... And, and I will stress, as I say in the little video I put on Twitter, you end up using only you know ten, twenty percent of the notes you've written down because your memory helps you out in the first instance, and more importantly, there's stuff going on in front of your eyes that you need to describe and you need to to get across. If you get bogged down in statistics, it's not going to help the commentary. So it's a it's a delicate balancing act, Alex. You know, getting the knowledge that you need from whatever sources you use, but using it sensibly at the same time. Definitely, yeah. And for a lot of people, Monday night session this week will live long in the memory. The first session back with the, the full crowd since March last year. But what have been your favourite moments covering darts for talk sport so far? Favourite moments? Um, well, going to the O2 for the, the, the Premier League final um, a few years ago uh, was a real kick. Uh, so to be at a venue of that size that was absolutely full for a Premier League final was quite a moment because, you know, you... You see the Premier League go to places like, you know, Dublin or Rotterdam, where they fill out these arenas, um, and you know, arenas around the UK as well. And you, you think fair play to, you know, 
Barry Hearn and, and what the PDC have done. And then you go to a thing like a Premier League final and there's not a seat to be had. Uh, and that's that's quite a kick to um, witness things like that. But, um, you know, being at the, 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 the two homes of darts in the Winter Gardens here in Blackpool and Alexandra Palace, um, just being there is enough for me. There's, there's been some some fantastic games down the years. I thought Chizzy Vandenberg last mm. night was a brilliant game of darts and Vandenberg ended up with a very, very good average, probably the best of the tournament so far, breaking 180 records. Um, it was a really high quality game of darts and the, how great it was that, you know, you got fans back in to, to witness something as, uh, as nip and tuck as that one was for, for as long as it was. But yeah, so many great memories. I, 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 Jeffrey Zizwan knocking out Michael Van Gerwen in the first round here three years ago sticks in the memory because that was, for me, the first sign that Van Gerwen was fallible. We were waiting for Van Gerwen to kind of assume the mantle from, from Phil Taylor after the power had retired. Um, and Zizwan um, absolutely uh, took him to the cleaners in that first round at, um, at, at the Winter Gardens. And it was quite a moment for me because it, it it kind of told me that you weren't necessarily going to have another dominant player winning everything the same way that Phil had. And so it's proved, you know, Van Gerwen's had his moments, of course. Um, but other players have had them too. Uh, and Van Gerwen's not the... He's not the fearsome uh, opponent that Taylor was for everybody else. I think that's, you know, one great sign for darts is that there's such a competitive, uh, you know, scrap for, for the top honours in the game between a whole clutch of players of different generations too. Definitely agree with that. Well, before we let you go, we mentioned to a few of your colleagues that we were chatting to you, Paul Nicholson says to ask you about classic rock music and to mention you're a drummer. So we'll ask you if we could give you a, a ticket to see one rock band in their prime, who would it be? And what's the best venue you've played at yourself? Uh, who would I want to go and see? I mean, if we're talking people I've never seen, then I would love dearly to have seen uh, Thin Lizzy, I would say. Um, uh, I did see a version of Thin Lizzy after Phil Lynott had passed away, but I would dearly love to have seen Thin Lizzy in the mid 70s in their classic lineup from, you know, the boys of Ackintown era and Jailbreak and. Uh, things like that when they had Brian Robertson and Scott Gorham on guitars with Phil Linnett who else maybe um, ACDC when Bon Scott was their lead singer you know the guy that sang Highway to Hell he he passed away in 1980 and um, obviously Brian Johnson's been brilliant for ACDC since then but I'd like to have seen the original that, that lineup of of DC uh, with Bon Scott on lead vocals and what was the other question? Where would, where's, where's the best place I've played? Um, oh. Well, I have played at the NEC uh, with a, a Kiss tribute band I used to be in uh, called Dress to Kill. Uh, there was an event at the NEC uh, during a music live festival where they recreated um, a, a Donington Monsters of Rock festival lineup from the late 80s, which was like Iron Maiden, Kiss, uh, David Lee Roth, Megadeth, Guns N' Roses and Halloween, so they got tribute bands for all those acts uh, and did it in the same order. So we were second to last on, uh, playing to a few thousand people. Uh, so that was nice. Uh, but another one that sticks in the mind is about about 12 years ago now, Dressed to Kill, this Kiss tribute that I was in, went to play at a festival in Lorette de Mar, the Spanish holiday resort, on the beach. Um, as part of a festival called Clon Festival and we played to about 3,000 people that night stretched as far as the eye could see along the beachfront and that, that's a gig that I'll remember for the rest of my life it just it couldn't have gone any better so there you go one, one in this country and one overseas Superb well another of your TalkSport colleagues Chris Mason says to ask Ian what Bob Bupka would make of the Winter Gardens and Blackpool <laughs> Well you know I, I go by Bob Bupka and it sounds more like Homer Simpson <laughs> when I go into my Bob Bobka impression. But <laughs> hey, yeah. I said to Janice, my longtime assistant, you know, it's one of those where, you know, darts on the radio, it works. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. 
you could be on the hop there. Very good. And, and lastly, we can't leave you without getting a prediction. Who's going to be lifting the Phil Taylor Trophy on Sunday night? Well, Peter Wright thinks it's him, doesn't he? <laughs> He's um, full of confidence after the Super Series win in Coventry that well, he's not only going to win the match but he's going to win the Worlds as well but then I'm listening to Gary Anderson after he won he was quite dismissive of of well of Peter Wright's chances and his own Gary you know he was yeah. he was uh, thinking the old guard didn't have much of a chance um, I don't know I mean yeah I mean Snakebite did play so well in Coventry and, and uh, looked so in control I mean, Dimitri played smashing last night. Um, so maybe we've got to look at Dimitri maybe having the chance to retain his title. Nobody's really put down a marker. Even, you know, Rob Cross, who averaged 100 in the first round, went out to Callum Ridge yesterday. So anything can happen. But maybe if, you know, Dimitri can take heart from that performance when Chizzy put him under pressure and he found his way through it on his first uh, appearance at the Winter Gardens, even though he's reigning champion maybe he can go all the way and retain it what a moment that would be for the kid we shall see well Ian it's a pleasure to chat to you really appreciate you taking out the time to have a chat with us and we wish you all the best for the rest of the week in Blackpool cheers fella nice talking to you thanks again to Ian for joining us now as we head into the business end of the world match play only eight players left what have been your highlights and lowlights from the tournament so far well I think we in a way touched I assume it would be one of your lowlights as well, but I think we both touched on one of them, and that was the Glenn Durant, uh, Callan Ritz match, especially the beginning, because Glenn was clearly uncomfortable, like he has been for the better part of a year now, but so was Callan Ritz, and Glenn's performance, I think, was dragging Callan Ritz down. Glenn was 5 nil down, averaging more than Callan Ritz, but they're both averaging 75. That match was really difficult to watch, although it got better, and when Glenn hit the double and started to feel comfortable or as comfortable as he can right now. That was almost a highlight because it's we were seeing Glenn smiling for the first time in a year. That might even be a highlight within a match that was a low light. Beyond that, there's not really that many low lights. There were some poor performances. You know, Stephen Bunting did so much to get to this tournament, um, winning his first title in five years and just came out flat and never got into it. It was disappointing to see, especially after missing out last year and missing out on the uh, Grand Prix through COVID as well. So this was his first of those big sky tournaments that are exclusive to the top 32 qualifiers that he's played in in nearly two years and just wasn't able to get going. Um, but that, you know, there's not that many lowlights. Highlights, where to begin? I mean, the second round... Especially the matches that we just saw, at least uh, three of the four. The Michael smith Jose de Salsa match was fantastic. The Gary Anderson-Nathan Aspinall match, every bit as good. Those matches back-to-back were incredible, and it was a great start to a Wednesday night of darts. But the highlight has to be, and I, you probably have this down, you're probably going to say the same thing thing is to just be back at the Winter Gardens, to be back in front of a crowd after last year. And that's not to knock last year's tournament, because in terms of quality, last year's world match play was probably the best world match play there's ever been. But it was still missing something. Not being at the Winter Gardens, not being in front of a crowd, took something away from what was, in terms of darts, the best tournament, or the best world match play ever. We somehow made up for that a little bit so far, getting Dimitri Vandenberg to lift the trophy on the first night in front of the crowd to try to undo some of what we lost last year because of COVID was a good touch. But the bigger touch is just to be back at the Winter Gardens, just that little bit, to be back there with the crowd, the best venue in uh, the PDC, the best event or my favorite event at the very least, uh, maybe the World Championships is a better event, but my favorite event to be back where it belongs in front of a crowd. Uh, that has to be the highlight of the highlights. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the the start of the tournament, the, the PDC giving Dimitri the chance to go on the stage and, and lift the Phil Taylor trophy. And I'm hoping they're going to do that with the other major winners that we saw during the, the bar and closed doors times that we had. So Jose de Sosa, hopefully we'll get to see him lift that trophy in front of the Wolverhampton crowd or wherever the Grand Slam ends up being this year. Hopefully we'll get the chance to do that right at the top of my list was the, the world match play being back at the Winter Gardens. And, and like you say, this time last year, I think we were all just grateful more than anything that we did have a, a world match play in 2020 because there was probably times 
during the, the lockdowns and everything that was going on when we didn't think it was going to happen. Maybe they'll postpone it, push it back further in the year or, or just not do one. We, we were really unsure at times, but it, it was a good tournament last year, even without it being at Blackpool. But I think, yeah, having it back at the Winter Gardens has been a, a big plus. And if they'd have just kept with the, the limited crowd, I know we've been really fortunate this week where starting from Monday, we've had the no limits on the capacity, which has been even better. But even if they'd have had a, a limited capacity for the whole tournament, it still would have been great to see a crowd back in the Winter Gardens for the tournament. But like you, yeah, there's been some some really good games so far. I'll pick out the uh, the Joe Cullen, Chris Doby game in the first round. I thought that was a, a really entertaining game and a good finish to that one as well. Even the, the Daryl Gurney, Ian White game, OK, the averages, they weren't off the radar, but that was the first game back with that no limits on the, the crowd on Monday and the, the walk-ons for that game, that the crowd were really into it. And that's what Big Time Darts is all about, is having those players on the stage, having the, the walk-ons, getting the crowd going and the, the big shots, the, the big ton-plus finishes, the 180s and the, the fans, they they just add to the spectacle. They, they make it special. So that was a, a really good one to see. And you touched on some of those games that we've seen the last couple of nights. They were definitely some highlights. Low lights, like you say, it's not been too many. Yeah, there's been a, a few one-sided games that we've seen, a, a couple of 10-2s, which is never good to see, a, a 10-3 in there as well. And the Stephen Bunting performance as well, he, he didn't really turn up, unfortunately, for him. One thing I did want to point out as well is some of the, the booing that we've seen in some of the games, the particularly the, the Christoph Ratajski, Luke Humphreys game, the, the whistling that was going on there. I didn't think there's really any place for that. And, OK, we're not going to get to a time when we see Ross Bray do a, his, uh, his Rab Butler impression and say if you want to boo, go in the car park. But I think sometimes we could maybe get the fans a, a, a bit more on side. And even going Price's first walk-on with fans as a world champion being booed on that, I know it's something that's probably not going to go away, but would have been nice maybe to see him get a, a better reception as the world champion. Yes, indeed. And maybe he will get a better reception in the quarterfinals. I, I doubt it, but that, <laughs> that does bring us to the next thing, which is... Quarterfinal picks, five of the top eight in the world still in the event, as long as well as Nathan Aspinall, Christopher Tyski, and Callan Ritz. Uh, what are your quarterfinal picks? Okay, well, I'm going to go in the order of when these games are going to be playing. So I'll go first up the Thursday night uh, quarterfinals tonight when you listen to this. We've got Christopher Tyski against Callan Ritz kicking things off. It is, a, as I said earlier, is a first TV quarterfinal for Callan Ritz. Both players are looking to make their first semi final in the PDC anyway, on, on TV. We know Christoph Ratajski is a, a former major winner in the BDO. I think this is going to be a, a step too far for Callan on this occasion. He, we've seen his average creep up from the first round to the second round. I think it's going to need to do the same. We know Christoph is playing at a very consistent high level, that high 90s, low 100s. If Callan's got a chance, he's going to have to pull out the, the finishing like he did in the last game. And we know the format's going up to first to 16. Can he do that over five more legs? I think the chances are a little slimmer of that, but I think it is going to be tight in the early stages, but I think Christoph is just going to pull away. I'm going 16-11 on that first game. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. I, I just, Christoph has been, as I said, not that long ago on this show tonight, he's not dipped and he's still playing it better than his world ranking. Callan Ritz, he's improved by 10 points from his first match to his second match. If he improves by 10 points again, He'll have every chance to beat Christoph Ratajski, but even still, it might not be enough because that's the level Ratajski has played at in the first two matches. He's been playing at or around the ton. That's basically what we come to expect from him in, in televised matches now. In fact, what is it now, five consecutive televised matches? He averaged tournaments. He's averaged over 100 in his first match, and he has overall been getting better results in TV tournaments. He's gone better at the Worlds the last three years than the year previously. He's gone better at the World Match Play last year than his debut and if he wins another match he'll go better this year than last year he seems to be improving on television and getting more comfortable i think he will again i'm going to make the semifinals. you went 16 11 i'll go a little bit closer i'll go 16 13 i think callan will stay in that but i think uh Ritaisky's right now has gears that callan reds doesn't especially in the longer matches and especially on television and that'll make the difference and then after that, we've got the second quarterfinal on Thursday night, going Price, the top seed, going up against the defending champion, Dimitri Vandenberg. I think out of all the four games, this is the one that I'm most looking forward to. Is probably the hardest one to call for me. Going Price, he's, he's looking to become, I think, the third player ever 
to win all the original Sky Triple Crown titles. That's the, the World Championship, the World Match Play, the World Grand Prix only. Phil Taylor and Michael Van Gerwen have done that. And to hold all three at the same time as well would be something special. But from what we've seen from Dimitri van der Berg, especially that second round, he's not going to give up the Phil Taylor trophy lightly. So I think this one is going to go deep. I could see it going to the overtime, to the extra legs, but I think going price might just pull it out of the hat just before it goes to that. So I'm going to go 16-14 to the world number one going price. Yeah, this is this is such a difficult match to pick because they both are playing this week at a level that makes them a real threat. Dimitri to retain the title, Gurren to win it for the first time. Um, and Reggie will mean he'll complete the hat trick and hold them all at the same time. But beyond that, It'll uh, make the number of events that he hasn't yet won just decrease just that little bit more. And that'll leave just the UK Open, which he's been a finalist at a couple times, the Players' Championship Finals, which he made a couple years ago, and the uh, European Championships is the only ranking events he hasn't won. He'll have won four of the seven if he can win this one. But he has to get past Dimitri first. And... I do think he's going to win, but since you picked Dimitri and you went – sorry, since you picked Erwin and you went 16-14, I like the score line, but I'll go the other way just so that there's some difference between us. So I'm going to go Dimitri to win at 16-14, but it, it's really a coin toss. It's what a match this should be and hopefully will be. Definitely is. Well, on to Friday's quarterfinals, and first up we have Peter Wright against Michael Smith, second seed against the seventh seed. I touched on it earlier on in the show, the – record in, in TV knockout games between these two players it is 9-0 to Peter Wright. The last time they met was the, the Players' Championship Finals in a, a knockout game on TV. Peter Wright winning that one. And uh, as we've just seen Peter Wright throwing that 105 average, he is a player that is banging form and he always seems to, to bring a good level to the world match play. Michael Smith, as I've said, he's, he's had a good couple of runs in this tournament the last couple of years. He's on another good run. I did originally put down Peter Wright to win this game, but I've I've just got a feeling for Michael Smith, he might go to the final again and, and maybe even win the whole thing. I've, I don't know why, I've just got a feeling after what I've seen tonight, the win against Jose de Sosa. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to back the the underdog with the bookies on this one. I'm going to go 16-13 to the bully boy. Yeah, it's. I have that same feeling that you do right now. And it's, you know, you need a bit of luck to go on and win a title. It's very rare that a player goes on and wins one of these big titles without some luck. Even back in 2016, when Van Gurren was at his best, there were a few titles that he had to go through. And that's really much the only time that anyone has been able to get through tournaments without any luck since Phil Taylor back a decade ago. But even still, Van Gurren would always need something at some point, someone missing at a key moment. Michael Smith got that against Jose de Sousa. And that's not to take away from Michael Smith. Because Michael Smith, you you mentioned the 108 uh, earlier. Michael Smith had to then go and hit the shot and hit sometimes a very big shot to get through the line. But he got a bit lucky at times and what was a high quality match. And he's through to the next round. And maybe maybe that's just what he needs. Maybe that's just what he needed to get over the line finally. He got that match out of the way where he needed the luck. And now he's going to go on and lift his first title. I'm not saying he is, but maybe that is what it is. And I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go that he's going to beat Peter Wright. Uh, you said 16-13. I'll go 16-10. I think he'll play his best match so far in this tournament. And Peter Wright won't be able to keep up. Well then, final game in our quarterfinal lineup for this year's world match play. And it is Michael Van Gogh against Nathan Aspel. And these two, in terms of head-to-head recently, it's been pretty even. I think there's three wins for Nathan Aspinall, three wins for, for Michael Van Gogh and a, a draw in their last seven games. So it's been pretty close between these two, but this is the, the first time they're going to play over a distance of first to 16 legs, best of 31, or if it goes into the overtime even further. Again, it is a hard one to call because both players are, have shown some, some really good signs in their first couple of games. They've pulled out some big shots. I said about Van Gogh and winning the game tonight with Ian White, a 1-2-1 finish when... Ian White was coming back at him. Nathan Aspinall, he pulled out an 11 data to beat Gary Anderson against the throw, which is a sign of a world-class player. And I think this is going to be one of those games that is going to come down in the end to who can produce those moments of magic the most between them. So I think it's going to be, again, I think it's going to be a great game to finish off the quarterfinals. 
it's a hard one to call, but I think given that the experience that Michael has in these situations, this is Nathan's best run so far. I think it is going to be Michael that maybe just edges it. I'm going to go 16-13 to the former champ. Yeah, I'll be different again. I'll, I'll go for the ASP to get over the line. Ben Gurren hasn't looked like the champion so far, and it's... I mean, that's been the case for many. Well, he hasn't been a champion of any tournament so far this year, but he hasn't looked like a champion in his first two matches. The first session against Ian White aside. And he's had too many dips in form. Nathan Aspinall will take advantage of that. If Van Gurren comes out and has a session like Ian, like Michael Van Gurren had in the second session of both matches so far, he might win all five legs. Yes, it's a long run because you have to get to 16. But if... Let's say Aspinall edges the first session 3-2. We could be talking 7-3 if Van Gurren comes out of the break like he has in the first two matches. And I don't know if Van Gurren right now is playing at a level where he can draw back a big deficit like that. So I'm just going to go based on what I've seen in the first two matches. I'm also being a little bit different so that we don't have the same picks. And I think Nathan Aspinall will take an early lead. I think Van Gurren will have a bad session like he's had in each of his first two matches. And he'll hold on. And he'll win this match something like 16-11 or 16-12. So I'll go ask him. I'll go 16-11 uh, to get over the line and into his first world match play semifinal. And now we'll move on to our final guest on this week's show. And it is with the recent two-time European Challenge Tour winner, Matt Campbell. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by the two-time Challenge Tour title winner, Matt Campbell. Thanks for joining us, Matt. How are you doing? No, thank you. I know I'm doing well. How about yourself? Doing well, and we appreciate the time. And you've just finished up in Niedenhausen, four days of darts, six Challenge Tour events, three Euro Tour qualifiers. I was looking 38 games across those four days. How are you feeling after that? Uh, wish it was more games played, but can't win them all. Um, but I feel good, ready for the next one. And we were talking off air. You unfortunately weren't able to board your flight home yesterday on on the Tuesday when we were talking, and you had to wait until this upcoming weekend. What happened there? Uh, so... There was a travel ban from uh, Europe to the United States, which I did not know about. And when I spoke to people, there was, it, I was told they'd be fine to fly in. So there was that issue. And then for me to go back home to Canada, I'll have to quarantine for 14 days. Or if I wait till the 10th, I'll be fully vaccinated for 14 days and then I could fly home and not have to quarantine. So that's the plan now. Is that a similar situation for Gary Mawson, who was over there as well, or was he been able to get home? Uh, he was able to get home because he's a U.S. citizen now, so it was kind of easier for him. to. Be, they can't really keep him out of the country he lives in. Fair enough. Well, we'll come back to this past weekend a bit later, but let's first rewind back. We last had you on the show just before your PDC World Cup debut. What was it like getting over to Austria, meeting up with Jeff Smith, head of the tournament starting? Uh, it was an amazing experience. It's uh, not every day you get to play for your country and play the best players from their country, their respective countries. And playing with Jeff, he's been on the tour. He's had some good wins, played well. So kind of makes it easier when you have somebody to play with that has ex- his experience. Definitely, yeah. And you and Jeff, you got off to a, a great start that weekend. You knocked out the fourth seeds, Northern Ireland, in the first round. How did you find it up on the stage with no crowd there? It looked like you adjusted fairly quickly to that. Yeah, like uh, it was kind of the same for playing at home. Typically, people try to stay quiet when you're playing finals and stuff like that, which I don't agree with. I think they should be allowed as they want, since if you're trying to be a professional, it's not going to be quiet on stage. But yeah, it was a lot easier to just keep my head down and pay attention to what I'm doing instead of thinking about the whole atmosphere of the game. We saw that the next day as well, a 96 average from you in the the second round of the singles against New Zealand. You're through to the final day. How were you and Jeff feeling heading into that Sunday with it all up for grabs? Uh, I I can't speak for Jeff, but I felt great. Uh, I believe we meshed well as a team, and I believe we could have went farther if I didn't uh, miss some doubles. But that's the game sometimes, and I don't know. Hopefully I get to do it again next year. Or this year. I mean, yeah, you did come very close to getting through to that semi-final. You had a, a 97 average. You throw a, a 160 finish to beat Dimitri Vandenberg in the singles, just losing out to Belgium in that doubles decider. How did you reflect on that weekend, your first World Cup overall? Um, yeah, it was just a, a surreal experience. Uh, I believe that I played well. I know, I know I can play a bit better than that as well. 
So it was kind of disappointing in the doubles to miss my opportunities at doubles when against Dimitri, it seemed like I couldn't miss my doubles. But other than that, yeah, it was a great experience and knew I belonged from there. And I mentioned the 160. That seems to be your signature shot. You took it out against <laughs> Scott Waits at uh, Ali Pally as well. Is it your favorite of the big finishes? Um, whatever ones I hit are my favorite, but. Yeah, that one just seems to be the easiest, the easiest transition. Everything's right there and don't have to move around very much. Well, I've got to talk to you about that game with Scott at the World Championship last year. All 25 legs played and it was one of the best games of the tournament. Obviously, unfortunately for you, it didn't go your way. But what was it like being involved in such a close game like that? Uh, it was amazing. Like Everything was up for a battle. Um, there was a lot of times where I did not play, like I didn't challenge his throw very well which I noticed when I was playing him and he played well, like he played consistently through the whole match. Like every leg, he was just smashing everything. Um, and then it came down to the final leg, which I was not happy about after being up two nothing, I believe it was. And then he comes back and wins the next three. But yeah, those matches are prove why he's a professional and a world champion already. And it was just a fun one to be a part of. You're still obviously very new to the the big stage, the the PDC tournaments like that. Are you someone that will go back and and watch those games, analyze those games? How do you try and get the the best bits out of those games and the bits that you can improve on? Yeah, so typically, like, I will go back and watch and uh, look for the bad shots, like where something went wrong to see if I did something wrong mechanically or if I was, yeah, and then see if I could think about what was going on. But other than that, it just is what it is. Just have to prepare the better next time, and hopefully it goes my way. Well, let's look at this year so far then. When we last spoke, you mentioned Q School was an ambition of yours, and we saw your name on the entry list for the European Q School back in February. An even bigger commitment this time around with it being the two stages and obviously with the restrictions because of the pandemic. Were you always going to do Q School this year no matter what? Yeah, that, that was my plan. Like, uh, I spoke to my wife before even the World Cup, and uh, with the pandemic going on, there was really no travel to play darts. So we figured it'd be the best year to just try and see what can be done with it. And looking at that Q school, you made it to the final stage, but you missed out on getting a tour card. Leaving Germany, how were you feeling about the week? Did you view it as an experience to, to learn from, or were you disappointed that you weren't able to get the card? Um, I was disappointed with how I played. Um, I know coming over trying to get my tour card, it's going to be a tough go anyways. So not really like I can't be disappointed that I didn't get one, but I'm definitely disappointed that how I played. I didn't play up to how I normally can, which was the most frustrating part of the experience. But once again, first time over there, hopefully I can learn from the experience and move on. Definitely, yeah. We've, we've seen since then, you've been playing on some of the CDC streams. How much of a help has that been for you? And, and how are things now in Canada? Is it starting to open up again? Uh, no, in Canada, there's still no darts. No, nothing like nothing open to be able to play darts. Uh, and the CDC streams, like, uh, it forces you to play, I guess. But it's not the same playing at home or playing online than it is having that person standing right behind you while you're throwing for a double there's none of that pressure going on. It's just a reason to throw. Well, having said that, this probably answers my next question because I was going to come on to the weekend just gone and we were looking ahead to the, the challenge tour last week. We didn't mention your name because we didn't weren't sure if you were going to make it, make the trip to Germany. But as soon as Q School finished, were you always going to commit to the challenge tour? Yeah, that was, that was always the plan. Um, there's never a time that if... I can play something, I won't do my best to try and get there. If I'm allowed to play, chances are I'll be there. Fair to say it couldn't have gone, well, it couldn't have started much better for you winning the first event of those six, the first player from Canada to win a Challenge Tour title. What was that feeling like when the double went in to win the final? Um, relaxation. After <laughs> I won that, just it was all stress-free, but uh, maybe that wasn't the best option, considering I didn't play well again until the Sunday. I mean, there was times where I had spurts of playing okay, but yeah, it was a tough thing to explain, I guess. Yeah, I want to come on to that in a moment, but looking at the, I guess, the, the prize money breakdown of these Challenge Tour events, getting to a final, £1,000, winning the title, £2,000. We've had Jeff Smith on the show recently about the, the cost of travelling to the events and with the, the quarantine and everything. So 
how important was it for you to to get that title in the in the bank straight away with the cost that there is at the moment? Um, there, I'm never concerned about the how much the trip cost or try and recover that because as soon as I pay for something or whatever, that money's gotten to me. Like it's like blow, lighting it on fire, pretty much the same thing. <laughs> that way, it's there's not no added extra pressure on my mind. And I could just go in and whatever happens, if I win, I win. If I lose, I lose and don't have to worry about the added money pressure. That's definitely the, the right mindset to have. And 25 minutes after that title winning, double winning, you were starting your first match in the second event. How did you find that quick transition from events? And then on the flip side, when you go out early in the first event of the day and it's a three or four hour wait to get going for the next one. Well, that's the good part. Like in Canada or going to the U.S., that's typically the, how the pace works. If you make it to the final and you win, you have a quick five minutes before the next event is starting. So it's kind of like making it the same as playing at home, but just a different standard. Well, you saved your best starts for the Sunday. 205 averages on the way to winning the fifth event, your second title of the weekend. Did winning the two titles, did that surpass your expectations or were you confident that you could have a, a big weekend? Uh, I was confident if I played my game, I could have a big weekend. Um, I know the room is tough, but I know what I'm capable of as well. Um, there was a lot of tough games played throughout the whole weekend that I was able to grind out and come away with the win. But yeah, I was happy with the overall, how everything went. And now just got to let it go and think about September. Yeah, I'm sure you're well aware those two titles have put you top of the order of merit after the six events, six more, as you mentioned, to come in early September. We don't think there'll be any more added on to that. So best part of two months before you're back in Germany for those events. Will it be difficult to keep your mind off that position that you're at the top? Um, I don't think so, because I'm just going to treat the next six as a separate tournament and everybody's back at zero and just try to be number one after those first uh, six, uh, after the second six events. Fair enough. Well, as the world starts to open up, more events uh, are coming back. The CDC, they've got events in Florida this weekend, um, not to mention your 17th on the WDF rankings at the moment. What have you got lined up between now and the next Challenge Tour? I'm hoping there's going to be a CDC event in Canada before the next Challenge Tour. But other than that, there's really nothing. I was going to go play in a WDF event this weekend, but can't do that because I wasn't allowed in the U.S. So... As of right now, it's just play nothing and just keep preparing and practice. And lots to come in the, the second half of the year. It could potentially be a, a life-changing six months for you. How much are you looking forward to all and seeing what you can achieve? Um, I'm looking forward to quite a bit. Uh, I think I'm ready to see what this game has in store for me. And if I'm playing well, I think it could be life-changing. So I'm really looking forward to it. Good to hear. Well, Matt, congratulations again on the, the two titles at the weekend. Wish you safe travels back home and looking forward to, to seeing how you get on in, in the next Challenge Tour when that gets up. And thanks very much for joining us. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks again to Matt for joining us. And we'll finish up the show last week. The Darts World mourned the loss of Andy Fordham, the former BDO World Champion, passing away at the age of 59. How will the Viking be remembered? He'll be remembered as one of the icons of the sport, which says a lot about him as a personality and as a person because he doesn't have the CV of some of the other icons of the sport, but he was one of the most beloved players. But was a big growth period in darts, especially after um, the split where um, the sport was having to recover, first getting kicked off TV for the most part in 1988, but then the split damaging the reputation of a lot of the players, depending on which side of the split you were on. But as the sport tried to recover and grow out of that, he emerged as one of the stars and one of the uh, faces and one of the personalities of it. And it wasn't because he was exuberant or anything like that. It was because he let his darts do the talking and he just was a likable person. And he won a world masters. He won a world championship. He won a world championship at the, at the 10th asking after losing four previous semifinals, having to come back from 4-2 down, 3-0 and 4-2 down in a race to five in the semifinal, having to come back from 2-0 down in a set, breaking twice to stay in the match, and then going on and winning that match and going on and winning the world title against what might have been the best or the second best player in the world at the time in Raymond Barneveld in the semifinals and one of the best in Mervyn King in the final. He did it at the... He made it as tough as he could on himself and he still got through and won it. And that's something that you can't ignore. 
he won what was a very good world championship against a very good field when he was well past his uh, prime as a player. His prime was the late 90s. This was five years on from that. And he'll be remembered as a world champion as a result of it. And it's a world championship that he can't take away. And it's a world championship that you wouldn't want to take away. He's a player who was good enough to win one in the 90s, probably should have, never got over the line, but then rolled back the years and did in 2004. And the sport is better off for it. Um, he'll be missed. He'll be, it, the sport is less off, just as much it was better off for him winning the world title, it's less off without him now. And I'll just also mention that Grand Slam in 2015 came out of nowhere to qualify. As I said on the show almost a year ago now, it tells you how he was thought of as a person and as a player that in the middle of the World Grand Prix, I think it was the semifinals, maybe it was the finals, but in the middle of it was when the BDO was having the qualifiers. And less than a minute after he hit the winning double to qualify, the Sky commentators were mentioning the fact that he qualified because that's what that's how important it was to the sport and how much it meant to the people in the commentary box and to everyone watching that over in I think it was in Bridlington, Andy Fordham was able to get through the qualifiers and get back to a big televised event and that needed to be reported immediately. Uh, he was larger than life as a person and as a personality and as a figure in this sport. And he'll be remembered for so much, including that event, that qualification and, well, being a world champion. The the outpouring of reaction when the news broke last week from fans, players, officials, even people beyond that saying about how much they're going to miss him and what a, a great guy he was, what a gentleman he was and how good he was on the dartboard. And I'm not going to lie and say that I was glued to the screen at the time when he won the lakeside. I was only a kid back then. I, I weren't really following the darts. But when you get into the darts and you hear about these players, you look back at past games on YouTube or you find out about these players and I had a look back at that run that he had to the title 2004, the lakeside. And you mentioned that the semi-final against Rain Van Barneveld, the, the top seed at the time, coming back from 3-0 to beating 5-4, then going on to beat Mervyn King in the final. It was a, a very popular win. Some of the clips there still on YouTube of, of those games as well. I do uh, suggest anyone who wants to go and watch them, go and check them out because um, I don't think you'll find a more popular winner of the Lakeside ever and unless Dee Hedman won it when she got to all those finals. But he, he was a, a very popular player and I was reading it a few bits as well. That final, 4.6 million people watched it in the UK, which shows you how much attention he got, not just from darts fans, but the general public. I think uh, a lot of people knew the name Andy Fordham and you can't really say that about a lot of dart players. You've got Phil Taylor, Eric Bristow, Jockey Wilson. I think you could add Andy Fordham to that list as well. A lot of people knew the name and and knew who he was and we were fortunate to have him on the show our, our first year doing the show, 2017, towards the end of that year. And I always remember how polite he was and I said, what was your favourite moment in darts? And I was expecting him to come back with the world title, the winner at Lakeside or the World Masters. But he said that appearance in the Grand Slam 2015 and, and that, that said a lot for me of how he's gone through those those tough times, all his, his health problems to get back on that stage and got to mention the first three darts he had against Adrian Lewis, the 180s, just ju just a, a special moment in darts that we're, we're never going to forget and, you know, sad that we're not going to see him at the World Seniors. He was invited for that field this, this going ahead next year, but he will be remembered as, as a top player, a top guy and sadly no longer with us yes indeed and our thoughts of course go out to uh his family and uh his friends anything else for this week as always i've got to say big thank you to our guests for joining us thanks to ian thanks to, to matt for joining us spoke to matt a, a couple of weeks ago just after those um a couple of wins that he had on on the challenge store so thanks to him for his time and hopefully he's back home in canada now thanks everyone for listening hope you've enjoyed the darts so far and let us know what your picks are going to be for the quarterfinals if you think we've got it right. Well, you can soon let us know when the games have uh, been finished. But enjoy the rest of the darts and I'm sure we'll be back next week to review it and talk about who is the winner of the, the Phil Taylor Trophy. Indeed, we will be. And uh, maybe it'll be Dimitri Vandenberg again. Maybe it'll be Kellen Ritz. Maybe it'll be one of the other six quarterfinalists. You'll have to hang tight to find that out. Uh, but we'll, we will be back. Uh, we'll hopefully have... Uh, some of the players from the field in well, anyone you want to hear as we get to the next uh, Super Series and the next uh, 
well, I don't know if they'll call it a Super Series because it's only two events, but they might be. But the next set of players, championship events, and as we get deeper into the summer, closer to the events, uh, to all those televised events in October, November, uh, let us know who you want on. Send in your questions. Send in whatever you want. And whether we'll respond, you'll have to hang tight and find out. Uh, just like you'll have to hang tight and find out who lifts that Phil Taylor trophy in a few days' time.